Section 9 of Astounding Stories 5, May 1930. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Alan Winteroud. Astounding Stories 5, May 1930. Brigands of the Moon by Ray Cummings, Chapters 23 and 24. What Has Gone Before? One day in 2075, the interplanetary spaceship Planetara left the Earth for Mars. I, Greg Haljan, was the third officer. It was destined to be a tragic voyage, for in our midst were unscrupulous brigands, masquerading as harmless passengers, intent on seizing the secret treasure of radium ore Johnny Grantline of the Grantline Expedition had dug from the moon. The Planetara was to stop on the moon and pick the treasure up on her return trip from Mars. Miko, a giant Martian, and his sister Moa were the ringleaders. With them were, as passengers, Sir Arthur Coniston and Ab Han, a Venus mystic. The whole crew was in their pay. Miko struck. The captain was killed, as were the officers. Only Snap Dean, the radio helio operator, Venza, a girl of Venus, and I were left. And, of course, Anita Prince, who had captivated my heart upon my first glimpse of her. The brigands abandoned the other passengers on a small asteroid, and Miko signaled his spaceship far off on Mars to meet him on the moon. I was forced to guide the Planetara to the moon. We sighted the huts of the Grantline expedition, and suddenly, just as we started to descend, the controls snapped, and the Planetara tumbled like a spent rocket. Desperately I tried to check her, but only partially succeeded. We crashed horribly against the barren gray rock of the moon. Anita, Venza, Snap, and I lived through it, but we could not find the bodies of Miko and Moa in the wreckage. Evidently they were still alive somewhere. We reached Johnny Grantline. The Planetara was a complete wreck, and speeding to us from Mars was Miko's brigand ship. We were powerless, without means of leaving the moon, and completely at the mercy of Miko's fast-approaching brigands. Chapter 23 The Prowling Watchman Try it again, Snap urged. Good God, Johnny, we've got to raise some Earth station. Chance it. Use your power. Run it up to the full. Chance it. We were gathered in Grantline's instrument room. The duty man, with blanched, grim face, sat at his cinders. The Grantline crew shoved close around us, tense and silent. Above everything, we must make some Earth station aware of our plight. Conditions were against us. There were very few observers in the high-powered Earth stations who knew that an exploring party was on the moon. Perhaps none of them. The government officials who had sanctioned the expedition, and Halsey and his confreres in the detective bureau, were not anticipating trouble now. The Planetara was supposed to be well on her course to Farrakh Shan. It was when she was due to return that Halsey would be alert. And it seemed, too, that nature was against us. The bulging half-Earth hung poised near the zenith over our little crater. Its rotation through the hours was clearly visible. We timed our signals when the western hemisphere was facing us. But nature was against us. No clouds, no faintest hint of mist could fog the airless lunar surface. But there were continuous clouds over the Americas. Try it again, Snap urged. These bulging walls. Grantline used his power far beyond the limits of safety. He cut down his lights. The telescope intensifiers were permanently disconnected. The ventilators were momentarily stilled, so that the air here in the little room crowded with men rapidly grew fetid. All to save power pressure that the vital Arendt system might survive. Even so, it was strained to the danger point. The walls seemed to bulge outward with the pressure of the room, the aluminite braces straining and creaking, and our heat was radiating away. The deadly chill of space crept in. Again, ordered Grantline. The duty man flung on the power in rhythmic pulses. In the silence, the tubes hissed. The light sprang through the banks of rotating prisms, intensified up the scale until, with a vague, almost invisible beam, it left the last swaying mirror and leaped through our overhead dome into space. Commander! The duty man's voice carried an appeal. These bulging walls. If they cracked or even sprung a serious leak, the camp would be uninhabitable. Enough, said Grantline. 
Switch it off. We'll let it go at that for now. It seemed that every man in the room had been holding his breath in the darkness. The lights came on again. The Arendt's motors accelerated to normal. The strain on the walls eased up, and the room began warming. Had the Earth caught our signal? We did not want to waste the power to find out. Our receivers were disconnected. If an answering signal came, we could not know it. One of the men said, let's assume they saw it. He laughed, but it was a high-pitched, tense laugh. We don't dare even use the telescope. Our rescue ship will be right overhead, visible to the naked eye before we see it. Three more days, that's what I'll give it. But the three days passed, and no rescue ship came. The earth was almost at the full. We tried signaling again. Perhaps it got through, we did not know. But our power was weaker now. The wall of one of the rooms sprang a leak, and the men were hours repairing it. I did not say so, but never once did I feel that our signals were seen on Earth. Those cursed clouds. The Earth almost everywhere seemed to have poor visibility. Four of our eight days of grace were all too soon passed. The brigand ship must be halfway here by now. They were busy days for us. If we could have captured Miko and his band, our danger would have been less imminent. With the treasure insulated so that its gamma rays could not betray us, and our camp in darkness, the arriving brigand ship might never find us. But Miko knew our location. He would signal his oncoming ship when it was close and lead it to us. Three times during those days, and the days which followed them, Grantline sent out searching parties. But it was unavailing. Miko, Moa, and Coniston, with their five underlings, could not be found. We searched all the territory from the camp to the Planetara and off to the foot crags of Archimedes and a score of miles into the flatness of the Mare Imbrium. There was no sign of the brigands, yet we knew they could be near here. It was so easy to hide amid the tumbled crags, the ravines, the gullies, the numberless craters and pit holes, or underground in the vast honeycomb subterranean recesses. We had at first hoped that the brigands might have perished, but that was soon dispelled. I went about the third day with a party that was sent to the Planetara. We wanted to salvage such of its equipment, its unbroken power units, as might be available. And Snap and I had worked out an idea which we thought might be of service. We needed some of the Planetara's smaller gravity plate sections. Those in Grantline's wrecked little comet had stood so long that their radiations had gone dead. But the Planetara's were still efficacious. We secured the fragments of Newtonia. But our hope that Miko might have perished was dashed. He too had returned to the Planetara. The evidence was clear before us. The vessel was stripped of all its power units, save those which were dead and useless. The last of the food and water stores was taken. The weapons in the chart room, the Benson curve lights, bullet projectors, and heat rays had vanished. Other days passed. The Earth reached the full and began waning. The 28-day lunar night was in its last half. No rescue ship came from Earth. We had ceased our efforts to signal, for we needed all our power to maintain ourselves. The camp would be in a state of siege. That was the best we could hope for. We had a few short-range weapons, such as Benson's, heat rays, and rifles. A few hundred feet of effective range was the most any of them could obtain. The heat rays, in giant form one of the most deadly weapons on Earth, were only slowly efficacious on the airless moon. Striking an intensely cold surface, their warming radiations without atmosphere to aid them were slow to act. Even in a blasting heat beam, a man in his Arendt's helmet suit could withstand the ray for several minutes. We were, however, well equipped with explosives. Grantline had brought a large supply for his mining operations, and much of it was still unused. We had also an ample stock of oxygen fuses, and a variety of oxygen light flares in small, fragile glass globes. It was to use these explosives against the brigands that Snap and I were working out our scheme with the gravity plates. The brigand ship would come with giant projectors and with some thirty men. If we could hold out against them for a time, the fact that the planetary was missing would bring us help from Earth. A month, said Grantline, a month at the most. If we can hold them off that long, even in a week or two, help may come. Another day. A tenseness fell on us all, despite the absorption of our feverish activities. 
To conserve the power, the camp was almost dark. We lived in dim, chill rooms, with just a few weak spots of light outside to mark the watchmen on their rounds. We did not use the telescope, but there was scarcely an hour when one or the other of the men was not sitting on a cross piece up in the dome of the little instrument room, casting tense searching gaze into the black starry firmament. A ship might appear at any time now, a rescue ship from Earth, or the brigands from Mars. Anita and Venza during these days could aid us very little save by their cheering words. They moved about the rooms trying to inspire us, so that all the men, when they might have been humanly sullen and cursing their fate, were turned to grim activity or grim laughter, making a joke of this coming siege. The morale of the camp now was perfect, an improvement indeed over the inactivity of the formal peaceful weeks. Grantline mentioned it to me. We'll put up a good fight, Haljan. These fellows from Mars will know they've had a task before they ever sail off with this treasure. I had many moments alone with Anita. I need not mention them. It seemed that our love was crossed by the stars, with an adverse fate dooming it, and Snap and Venza must have felt the same. Among the men we were always quietly, grimly active, but alone, I came upon Snap once with his arms around the little Venus girl. I heard him say, Accursed luck, that you and I should find each other too late, Venza. We could have had a mighty lot of fun in Great New York together. Snap, we will. As I turned away, I murmured, And pray God, so will Anita and I. The girls slept together in a small room of the main building. Often during the time of sleep, when the camp was stilled except for the night watch, Snap and I would sit in the corridor near the girls' door grid, talking of that time when we would all be back on our blessed earth. Our eight days of grace were past. The brigand ship was due, now, tomorrow, or the next day. I recall that night my sleep was fitfully uneasy. Snap and I had a cubby together. We talked and made futile plans. I went to sleep but awakened after a few hours. Impending disaster lay heavily on me, but there was nothing abnormal nor unusual in that. Snap was asleep. I was restless, but I did not have the heart to awaken him. He needed what little repose he could get. I dressed, left our cubby, and wandered out into the corridor of the main building. It was cold in the corridor and gloomy with the weak blue light. An interior watchman passed me. All as usual, Haljan. Nothing in sight? No, they're looking. I went through the connecting corridor to the adjacent building. In the instrument room, several of the men were gathered, scanning the vault overhead. Nothing, Haljan. I stayed with them a while, then wandered away. The outside man met me near the admission lock chambers of the main building. The duty man here sat at his controls, raising the air pressure in the locks through which the outside watchman was coming. The relief sat here in his bloated suit, with his helmet on his knees. It was Wilkes. Nothing yet, Haljan. I'm going up to the peak of the crater to see if anything is in sight. I wish that damnable brigand ship would come and get it over with. Instinctively, we all spoke in half whispers, the tenseness bearing in on us. The outside man came out of his helmet. He was white and grim, but he grinned at Wilkes. All as usual. He tried the familiar jest at Wilkes, but his voice was flat. Don't let the earth light get you. Wilkes went out through the ports, a process of no more than a minute. I wandered away again through the corridors. I suppose it was half an hour later that I chanced to be gazing through a corridor window. The lights along the rocky cliff edge were tiny blue spots. The head of the stairway leading down to the abyss of the crater floor was visible. The bloated figure of Wilkes was just coming up. I watched him for a moment, making his rounds. He did not stop to inspect the lights. That was routine. I thought it queer that he passed them. Another minute passed. The figure of Wilkes went with slow bounds over toward the back of the ledge where the glassite shelter housed the treasure. It was all dark off there. Wilkes went into the gloom, but before I lost sight of him, he came back. As though he had changed his mind, he headed for the foot of the staircase, which led up the cliff face to where, at the peak of the little crater, 500 feet above us, the narrow observatory platform was perched. He climbed with easy bounds, the light on his helmet bobbing in the gloom. I stood watching. 
I could not tell why there seemed to be something queer about Wilkes's action. But I was struck with it nevertheless. I watched him disappear over the peak of the summit. Another minute went by. Wilkes did not reappear. I thought I could make out his light on the platform up there. Then abruptly, a tiny white beam was waving from the observatory platform. It flashed once or twice, then was extinguished. And now I saw Wilkes plainly, standing in the earthlight, gazing down. Queer actions. Had the earthlight touched him? Or was that a local signal call which he had sent out? Why should Wilkes be signaling? What was he doing with a hand helio? Our watchman, I knew, had no reason to carry one. And to whom could Wilkes be signaling across this lunar desolation? The answer stabbed at me. To Miko's band. I waited another moment. No further light. Wilkes was still up there. I went back to the lock entrance. Spare suits and helmets were here beside the keeper. He gazed at me inquiringly. I'm going out, Frank, just for a minute. It struck me that perhaps I was a meddlesome fool. Wilkes, of all Grantline's men, was, I knew, most in his commander's trust. The signal could have been part of the night's ordinary routine, for all I knew. I was hastily donning an Arendt suit. I added, let me out. I just got the idea that Wilkes is acting queerly. I laughed. Maybe the earthlight has touched him. With my helmet on, I went through the locks. Once outside with the outer panel closed behind me, I dropped the weights from my belt and shoes and extinguished my helmet light. Wilkes was still up there. Apparently he had not moved. I bounded off across the ledge to the foot of the ascending stairs. Did Wilkes see me coming? I could not tell. As I approached the stairs, the platform was cut off from my line of vision. I mounted with bounding leaps. In my flexible gloved hand, I carried my only weapon, a small bullet projector with oxygen firing caps for use in this outside near vacuum. The leaden bullet with its slight mass would nevertheless pierce a man at the distance of 20 feet. I held the weapon behind me. I would talk to Wilkes first. I went slowly up the last hundred feet. Was Wilkes still up there? The summit was bathed in earthlight. The little metal observatory platform came into view above my head. Wilkes was not there. Then I saw him standing on the rocks nearby, motionless. But in a moment he saw me coming. I waved my left arm with a gesture of greeting. It seemed to me that he started, made as though to leap away, then changed his mind and waited for me. I sailed from the head of the staircase with a twenty-foot leap and landed lightly beside him. I gripped his arm for autophone contact. Wilkes. Through the visors, his face was visible. I saw him, and he saw me, and I heard his voice. You, Haljan, how nice. It was not Wilkes, but the brigand Coniston. Chapter 24. Imprisoned. The duty man of the exit locks on the main building stood at his window and watched me curiously. He saw me go up the spider stairs. He could see the figure he thought was Wilkes standing at the top. He saw me join Wilkes, saw us locked together in combat. For an instant, the duty man stood amazed. There were two fantastic, misshapen figures swaying in the earthlight, five hundred feet above the camp, fighting desperately at the very brink. They were small, dwarfed by distance, alternately dim and bright as they swayed in and out of the shadows. Soon the duty man could not tell one from the other. Haljan and Wilkes fighting to the death! The duty man recovered himself and sprang into action. An interior siren call was on the instrument panel near him. He rang it, alarming the camp. The men came rushing to him, Grantline among them. What's this? Good God, Frank! They saw the silent, deadly combat up there on the cliff. The two figures had fallen together from the observatory platform, dropped twenty feet to a lower landing on the stairs. They lay as though stunned for a moment, then fought on. Grantline stood stricken with amazement. That's Wilkes. And Haljan, the duty man gasped, went out. Something wrong with Wilkes, acting strangely. The interior of the camp was in a turmoil. The men awakened from sleep, ran out into the corridor, shouted questions. An attack? Is it an attack? The brigands? But it was Wilkes and Haljan in a fight out there on the cliff. The men crowded at the bullseye's window and over all the confusion the alarm siren, with no one thinking to shut it off, was screaming with its electrical voice. 
Grantline, stricken for that moment of inactivity, stood gazing. One of the figures broke away from the other, bounded up to the summit from the stair platform to which they had fallen. The other followed. They locked together, swaying at the brink. For an instant, it seemed to Grantline that they would go over. Then they surged back, momentarily out of sight. Grantline found his wits. Stop them! I'll go out to stop them! What fools! He was hastily donning one of the Arendt suits, which stood at the lock entrance. Shut off that siren, Frank! Within a minute, Grantline was ready. The duty man called from the window. Still at it! By the infernal! Such fools! They'll kill themselves! The figures had swayed back into view, then out of sight again. Frank, let me out. Grantline was ready. He stood, helmet in hand. I'll go with you, Commander. But the volunteer was not equipped. Grantline would not wait. I'm going at once. Hurry, Frank. The duty man returned to his panel. The volunteer shoved a weapon at Grantline. Here, take this. Grantline jammed on his helmet. He moved a few steps into the small air chamber, which was the first of the three pressure locks. Its interior door panel swung open for him, but the door did not close after him. Cursing the duty man's slowness, he waited a few seconds. Then he turned to the corridor. The duty man came running. Grantline took off his helmet. What in hell? Broken! Dead! What? Smashed from outside, gasped the duty man. Look here, my tubes! The control tubes of the ports had flashed into a closed circuit and burned out. The admission ports would not open. And the pressure control smashed, broken from outside. There was no way now of getting out through these pressure locks. The doors, the entire pressure lock system, was dead. Had it been tampered with from outside? As though to answer Grantline's amazed question, there came a chorus of shouts from the men at the corridor windows. Commander! My God, look! A figure was outside, close to the building. Clothed in suit and helmet, it stood bloated and gigantic. It had evidently been lurking at the port entrance, had ripped out the wires there. It moved past the windows, saw the staring faces of the men, and made off with giant bounds. Grantline reached the window in time to see it vanish around the building corner. It was a giant figure, larger than a normal Earthman. A Martian? Up on the summit of the crater, the two small figures were still fighting. All this turmoil had taken no more than a minute or two. A lurking Martian outside? The brigand, Miko? More than ever, Grantline was determined to get out. He shouted to his men to don some of the other suits, and called for some of the hand bullet projectors. But he could not get out through these main admission ports. He could have forced the panels open, perhaps. With the pressure-changing mechanisms broken, it would merely let the air out of the corridor. A rush of air, probably uncontrollable. How serious the damage was, no one could tell as yet. It would perhaps take hours to repair. Grantline was shouting, Get those weapons! That's a Martian outside! The brigand leader, probably. Get into your suits. Anyone who wants to go with me will go by the manual emergency exit. But the prowling Martian had found it. Within a minute, Grantline was there. It was a smaller two-lock gateway of manual control so that the person going out could operate it himself. It was in a corridor at the other end of the main building. But Grantline was too late. The lever would not open the panels. Had someone gone out this way and broken the mechanisms after him, a traitor in the camp? Or had someone come in from outside? Or had the skulking Martian outside broken this lock as he had broken the other? The question surged on Grantline. His men crowded around him. The news spread. The camp was a prison. No one could get out. And outside, the skulking Martian had disappeared. But Wilkes and Haljan were still fighting. Grantline could see the two figures up on the observatory platform. They bounded apart, then together again crazily swaying, bouncing, striking the rail. They went together in a great leap off the platform onto the rocks, and rolled in a bright patch of earthlight. First one on top, then the other, they rolled unheeding to the brink. Here, beyond the midway ledge which held the camp, it was a sheer drop of a thousand feet on down to the crater floor. The figures were rolling, then one shook himself loose, rose up, seized the other, and with a desperate lunge, shoved him. The victorious figure drew back to safety. 
The other fell hurtling down into the shadows past the camp level, down out of sight in the darkness of the crater floor. Snap, who was in the group near Grantline at the windows, gasped. God, was that Greg Haljan who fell? No one could say. No one answered. Outside on the camp ledge, another helmeted figure now became visible. It was not far from the main building when Grantline first noticed it. It was running fast, bounding towards the spider staircase. It began mounting. And now still another figure became visible, the giant Martian again. He appeared from around the corner of the main Grantline building. He evidently saw the winner of the combat on the cliff, who was now standing in the earthlight, gazing down. And he saw, too, no doubt, the second figure mounting the stairs. He stood quite near the window through which Grantline and his men were gazing, with his back to the building, looking up to the summit. Then he ran with tremendous leaps towards the ascending staircase. Was it Haljan standing up there on the summit? Who was it climbing the staircase? And was the third figure Miko? Grantline's mind framed the questions, but his attention was torn from them, and torn even from the swift, silent drama outside. The corridor was ringing with shouts. We're imprisoned! Can't get out! Was Haljan killed? The brigands are outside! Then an interior autophone blared a call for Grantline. Someone in the instrument room of the adjoining building was talking. Commander, I tried the telescope to see who got killed. But he did not say who got killed, for he had greater news. Commander, the brigand ship! Miko's reinforcements from Mars had come. End of Brigands of the Moon by Ray Cummings, Chapters 23 and 24